Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to our July 26th Left Plan 2 board meeting. I'd like to call it to order. Uh, let's go ahead and take a moment of silence to remember our fallen brothers and sisters as well as our military. All right, thank you very much. On our agenda, first item of business is uh, the approval of our minutes. Entertain a motion to adopt. Motion. Motion to be made. Second. Sir, sir. Motion to be made and seconded to adopt the minutes as presented. Discussion? Questions? I'll keep an eye on the screen, make sure I'm not missing anybody online. Seeing none, all those in favor, say aye. Aye. Opposed? All right. We should be good to go. Thank you very much. Motion passes. Item number two is the DRS public records privacy presentation. Sean Merchant's going to be doing that. So good morning, Sean. Steve, you want to, by way of background? Um, the Department of Retirement Systems is sharing their um, thoughts about um, improving member privacy with both the Left 2 Board and with the Select Committee on Pension Policy. Um, Sean is here from the Department of Retirement Systems to describe where they're at in the process and where they're going from here. And with that, I will turn it over to Sean. Thank you, Steve. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the board. I really appreciate the opportunity to come and give you a preview of what we're thinking in terms of uh, legislation we'd like to propose uh, from DRS and possibly uh, we'll see with input or uh, possible endorsement from the Select Committee on Pension Policy. As Steve mentioned, I did this presentation last week uh, to the Select Committee to give them sort of a taste and a preview of what we were thinking, and they have scheduled uh, further uh, discussion about the topic for, I believe it's October of this year, so we'll see where that goes, but I wanted to bring it to you because uh, your members are our members as well, and this does affect um, both our groups. So. What we're looking at doing, uh-oh, Tim, I think I, oops, need a little technical help here. Okay. Uh, da -da 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 -da. Let me see where we're at here. That's the wrong, I will get it for you. So just on the, yeah, I would just do it down here. Okay. This involves fine motor skills. We'll see how this goes. So our proposed legislation, what we're thinking of doing is a, an, except, an exception to the Public Records Act. It would be specific to DRS. It would only affect the statutes for DRS. It wouldn't be anybody else's statutes. And it would exempt the release of records for specific groups. That would be our retirees and slash payees, active and inactive members. So pretty much everybody that's contained within the data in our system. It would prohibit the release of names with the date of birth. Now, we realize that some people, the media in particular, like the, the ability to um, get this information, to use it for investigations or other means. There would be um, an ability within the legislation to seek this information, but it would be, uh, there would be a process by which they would request the release instead of just a, a blanket release of all of our data. So that's built into the legislation, so they would retain the ability to do that. And as is currently um, in the, the current uh, statute, the person that is named in a records request would retain the ability to try and get an injunction from us releasing that information. That's currently in statute. That would remain in statute. So those, those provisions would not change. So a summary of what we're looking to do is um, <coughs> what uh, large public requests impede DRS's ability to actually administer current exemptions to the Public Records Act. There are certain people that are exempt from disclosure. I, one comes to mind from my former life in the Secretary of State's office was the Address Confidentiality Program. These are people that are victims of domestic violence um, and they have their records sort of sealed so they're not released. We don't really have a way to easily pull them out of our database because their employers don't necessarily send that their participants in that program to us. They're sending wage and hour information. So it's difficult to, um, for us to administer the act right now. 
And it's also really difficult for us to protect our customers from identity theft or elder fraud. And we'll get into a little what we're seeing on that front a little bit later in the, in the presentation. Um, so background, some of the requests or types of requests we're seeing are being processed by us in the last two years. There are eight requests for groups of individuals. And some of those groups of individuals range from just a small a few dozen people to basically over 100,000, nearly 900,000 members, our entire data set. That's the type of thing that you would think the Seattle Times would request and then get. And those uh, releases can, can include name, date of birth, retirement amounts. That seems to be increasingly what's being looked for. Retirement date, again, as we'll get to a little bit later, that's becoming more uh, and more requested. And who their last employer was. Um, some of these data recipients do publish this data, like in large searchable formats uh, that you would see on public websites. Um, so some of the challenges in administering the current exemptions, we collect retirement information, like I said, but we do not collect information that would trigger an information, like I was telling you about the address confidentiality program, or if there's anybody who's in law enforcement whose records should be, you know, kind of kept quiet. We don't have an easy way to, to search for those exemptions out of our data set. Um, I mentioned the domestic violence victims, they're the participants in the Address Confidentiality uh, Program. They, um, they would re register now with their employer, but we don't, that information isn't really sent to us. So it makes it very difficult for us to protect our members as it sits right now. This legislation would give us the ability to adequately protect not just them, but everybody's information from um, getting released and looked at. Um, Getting into a little bit of what we're seeing in terms of theft and elder fraud, the best measure that we could find to describe identity theft or elder fraud as a problem on the national level, level is the FBI's elder fraud report. So they conduct a report or do a report on this. And the numbers in the report include all sorts of cyber fraud, not just the identity theft that we see at DRS and what we're actually experiencing. So it's more broad based. But the numbers indicate that cybercrime is a really a national issue, as we all know, and some of the actors are not just with, contained within the borders of this state or the United States, but from foreign uh, countries. And in fact, we're seeing that in people trying to ping our data are not necessarily in Lacey, they're in other countries. Um, and we are not immune, obviously, from this threat and from these people trying to get this information. When looking at the data, it is important also to understand that the fraud in the report only includes the events that were reported to the FBI. It does not include all of the events that happen, all of the things that happen uh, and are reported to local jurisdictions. It's only what the FBI is made aware of. And another indicator for us, for DRS, of the growing nature of this challenge is that our peers across the nation, and as you know, we spend a lot of time and effort conferring with peers for best practices and just to see what they're doing and why and how. Um, our peers across the country are sharing that their retire retirees are being targeted at a much higher rate and in a much more deliberate manner than they have been in the past. And that is something that we are seeing um, with, with our fraudsters as well. Uh, so unfortunately, just like our peers, we have experienced pretty significant growth in the number of identity theft events. Um, the overwhelming majority of the new events have occurred in the last six months. So we've seen a tremendous uptake really recently. And they were initiated by the same uh, criminal organization. When I say a significant uptick uh, in events, we're talking a 900% increase over the, the past year. So that's, that's pretty significant. We've known that uh, criminal organizations have been targeting our retirees for a number of years because retirement uh, and, and DRS and the investment board is a, is a big pot of money. So it's very attractive for cyber criminals to try and commit fraud and, and get to our, our uh, members' money. However, their behaviors are changing. The rate of attack is increasing significantly. They're pinging again and again and again. It's not just sort of a random here, check and see if I can get in. I, oh, I didn't, so I, I back off. It is, they are repetitive and they're organized. Um, <clears throat> so we also are seeing that they're going for um, targets of high value. 
So recently, what I mean is recently, retired state employees, uh, they're, they're focusing on retired state employees uh, that, uh, to get to their life lifetime savings. So think their DC accounts, their DCP accounts, but even changing, using identity theft to get in and get at their actual retirement. They can redirect their retirement checks if they, if they take over somebody's identity <clears throat> because they are trying to redirect not just the deferred comp, but their defined benefit um, account, defined benefit accounts also. <clears throat> it's also worth noting that in uh, fiscal year 23, the would-be thieves targeted over $12.6 million in people's lifetime savings. That's in their DC accounts alone that we've been able to, to identify from the targets they were looking at. It's also worth noting that due to the efforts of DRS, uh, our really good uh, IT staff and our record keeper Voya, we've been able to successfully turn away those attacks. But we're, we're nervous and we're concerned. Uh, it's not to say that we're not continually going to be on the forefront of trying to combat uh, cyber crime with the newest and uh, uh, latest technology that's available, but we're concerned uh, because of the, the increased growth, the number and frequency of attacks, something we definitely um, would lose sleep over. The new pattern also indicates that the, the would-be thieves are, are targeting um, their targets using publicly available data, so stuff that we currently just are given out. They acquire the necessary public PII uh, to attempt to steal what they can from, from our customers. They try to use fraud to get somebody to you know, unwittingly help them out to get to their account. But we will continue to do everything that we can to protect our customers and we strive to, to uh, identify individual records where, appropriate, where the appropriate exemption applies, but it's difficult to do. So there's the things that we're currently doing to protect our customers from theft is we've redesigned processes to add new layers of verification, which you think you're going to continually have to do. And so we're going to continually be doing that and notifying customers of changes, and sometimes there's frustration, but in the end of the day, it's for their, their benefit that we're protecting them. Um, but this also means that we're redirecting retirement resources, um, as well as having senior retirement specialists follow up, follow up with the victims or potential victims to ensure their benefits and lifetime savings are, are being secured. So it's taking resources that we could be using to process retirements to really focus on this. It's not something we, even a year ago, two years ago, planned on really having to redirect those uh, resources that way, but it's, it's a draw. We've changed certain online processes and altered how some transactions can be requested to address vulnerabilities. We've, we've looked at processes and tried to make them more secure, and we continually do that. And we're proposing this legislation hopefully limit the information that uh, these can use to identify victims. We don't want to be one of the sources that uh, these fraudsters can use to get some information that could then be used against us um, to target our members and your members. We're also identifying additional resources and tools that, that will help us combat this uh, growing threat and seek funding uh, in the budget process to bring some of those resources on board. I would note too that when I say that they're targeting specific individuals, they're, um, they're looking at recent retirees who have high account balances, um, and we're, we're talking within the last people that have retired in the last two years or so, and they are continually pinging and trying to get into those accounts. And so when somebody makes a change to their account, they know it, and they will continue. They will try and get in and steal their identity. So there, it's a very concentrated attack most recently, um, and that's what's concerning is they're more sophisticated and more I guess, dedicated to trying to commit this fraud. So with that, I welcome any questions, and I really do appreciate uh, the opportunity to kind of give you an insight into the legislation that we're looking at. Thanks, Sean. Representative Brookwist. Thanks, Dennis. Um, thanks, Sean. I obviously, being in the legislature for a few years, uh, the, we have the Sunshine Committee that you know usually takes a look at uh, public records requests or exemption requests and um, has this gone before the Sunshine Committee? Do they have a recommendation? Or, or? The Sunshine Committee, um, what they do, because I looked at that, they look at um, current exemptions. They don't look at proposed exemptions. 
And if you look at their website, we, uh, I think it was three years ago now, proposed an exemption for disability determination information. That is, they have not even looked at that request yet. Um, they're a number of years behind looking at requests. In fact, their chairman just recently resigned. I'm not even sure they're meeting. But they don't look at current, they don't look at proposals. They look at things that are in current law to see if they still need to be an exemption if it's because there's some things that as technology changes, perhaps it's not relevant or pertinent to be exempted anymore. But they don't review prior to, because that was my first step. Should I run it through them? And it appears it's not. However, I'm going to um, be talking to um, Senator Hunt also about this because he's involved with that. And we're talking to the media about just like we did for the disability um, exemption to see if there's a way to work with them to get them what they need because obviously there's a public public need and, and desire for some records um, without having to give away the whole farm. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. And you know, obviously our chair in the House would probably want to hear Certainly. from you as well. And I think Representative Paulette plays a, a role in some of these public records issues as well. Yeah, I'm gonna, I'll be making the rounds. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, John. Other questions? Hi, morning, Sean. Thanks for your presentation. Um, is there any metrics or um, do we have any hard numbers on how many data breaches we've had um, that would affect membership as far as? We have uh, not had a data breach that, is, that somebody has taken money. Like I said, in fiscal year 23, we had that number of uh, potential attacks. We have not lost in, in the current in the fiscal year that I have. We did not lose any money, members' money. Um, we're just very concerned that something could happen and we want to get ahead of the game by trying to limit the acts, limit the information that some people could use to keep hammering on us. Excellent. All right. Thanks, Sean. Other questions? Not seeing any. All right. Thank All right. you, sir. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Good to see you. Right. Number three on the list is a presentation by Jacob White. It's on overpayment responsibility. Steve? As you'll recall, this was a topic that the board started to touch on at the end of last interim. It sprung out of discussions about um, what was creating um, overpayments for members and how those were affecting their benefits to um, you know, make large adjustments um, to members' benefits years after they retired. The board um, asked, uh, moved that topic to this interim, and it was on your interim work plan that you adopted. And with that, I'll turn it over to Jacob. Okay, good morning. For the record, uh, Jacob White, staff to the board. So uh, the issue in front of the board today is when employers make an error that causes a retiree to receive an overpayment, uh, the member is, re is typically responsible for paying back the overpayment that they incorrectly received. So the policy issue in front of the board is who should pay for uh, an error that causes an overpayment um, or for an error in general. So. Uh, pension overpayments, in most cases, the member is responsible for paying back any overpayments they receive. And the policy behind that's pretty pretty easy to understand. I always just kind of think of if you check your you know checking account and all of a sudden you've got extra money in there, you, you know you can't spend it. Um, so the idea that someone has received money they shouldn't have, so they need to pay that money back. The difference in these circumstances is that the member has no way of knowing that they're receiving money they should um, not be receiving. So. Um, uh, the, there are some limited circumstances where employers are responsible, and um, in pension terms, it's in more recent years. So, the, uh, but not in left two. So, for the other uh, systems, most of the other systems, uh, in 2008, uh, there was a new law passed called the, the called the 2008 ERFs, the Early Retirement Factors, that allow PERS, TERS, SERS, maybe PSERS too. Um, uh, retirees to retire uh, at 62 without taking a reduction in their benefit if they have 30 years of service credit. Um, and with those, if the the employer uh, could end up uh, owing 
um, any overpayments the member uh, receives if they didn't correctly verify the, uh, em the their employee's retirement status. So there's really strict re uh, restrictions for return to work. If you retire with the 2008 IRFs, you can't return to work in pretty much any capacity with any public employer. But if you do and you continue to receive pension payments that you should not have received, um, and the employer didn't verify that you were a retiree, then the employer's on the hook for those overpayments. And um, so that, that's, yeah, the kind of main example of where an employer would be responsible. Um, just policy-wise, my understanding of why that's different than the other ones just has to do with, um, at least in part, with what was going on at that time, that there was concern about double dipping and people taking advantage of returning to work. And so there's this new law being passed that's gonna allow uh, people to retire early, and there was just concern that there would be, um, yeah, people uh, taking advantage of that in a way that wasn't intended, and they wanted to make sure that em employers uh, had responsibility to, to make sure that did not occur. Um, so other examples of um, employer errors, so there's uh, contributions owed. Uh, employer is responsible for the employee in those cases where there's contributions owed the employer is responsible for the employer and mem member contributions um, and so drs isn't tasked with going and getting that money from members instead it's the employer's responsibility and then it's called employer pickup and under that it's the employer's duty to go if, uh, if they want that money from members then they need to get that money from members and then there's also cases of lost investment earnings so when there's um, when contributions aren't collected when they're supposed to be collected, and that goes on for years, there's potential that there was um, the, yeah lost investment earnings. That money wasn't invested. The state, the trust fund didn't earn money on that, and typically that's subsidized by the plan. DRS has the authority, um, uh, but as far as I'm aware, has only uh, used that authority once to go back and. Um, uh, get those lost investment earnings. And that was in an extreme case, uh, Dolan versus King County that you probably have heard of, or at least I've spoke about a couple times, I believe. Um, and uh, and that one went back to like the early 80s or late 70s. And so it was a pretty extreme example where the lost investment earnings were so great that it would cause a contribution rate increase to all PERS members. And that was why DRS chose to go back and charge um, the court's didn't allow them to charge everything they wanted to charge, but they were able to charge uh, King County some of that, and some of it was subsidized uh, by plan members and other employers. So what causes uh, these overpayments? So typically uh, the ones we're looking at are misreported earnable compensation. Um, I use the term earnable compensation. I know when I talk to members, they usually say pensionable, and then it's also referred to in law sometimes as basic salary but it'll be earnable comp for this presentation. Um, so that causes the largest overpayments typically. Um, and uh, so what is and is not considered earnable compensation can be com complex. So don't wanna just get up here and pick on employers. Um, as I, we, Steve talked about briefly at the last meeting when we were looking at subjects um, in September, um, I'll be briefing you on two kind of extreme examples of how complicated earnable compensation can be. Um, so uh, I'll, talk a bit more about that on the slide coming up. Um, and also that earnable compensation is different plan to plan. So there's, yeah, for employers and employ, you know, multiple different uh, pension plans, they've got to have different uh, rules for what's earnable comp for the different plans, let alone the different collective bargaining agreements um, all come into play as well. So uh, Typically different types of pay, such as holiday, annual leave, overtime, are bargained between employers and employees. And um, when there's talking to DRS, it's often when these overpayments occur, there's been a change in that uh, collective bargaining language um, that no one, you know, giving everyone the benefit of the doubt, no one, no one believes it's gonna cause a change. They've been reporting something the same way for years there's a change in language, they could keep reporting it, or there's a new type of pay and people think they have an understanding of it. Um, but there's no requirement that the employer shares that language with DRS to get like a ruling on is this earnable comp or not. Um, so, see. so how does the employer uh, make these determinations of what's earnable comp? Um, 
obviously you start with the RCWs, not super helpful. It's, it's pretty broad. You got to drill down from there. Um, and so there are, uh, DRS does have rules uh, that further help with that, including some tables in those rules that list different types of pay and have linked to more information. Um, and then there's also the DRS Employer Support Division, and they provide um, employer notices, which go into greater detail on some of the more complicated issues. Um, they have an employer handbook, uh, which is a great resource, um, something I often refer to when preparing for presentations. Um, and then they also provide employer trainings. And then they have staff which are available to answer questions and they can review language if an employer or the union during bargaining want to, to have a DRS weigh in on that, um, they can send that language uh, to DRS and they will provide an answer. So there is a, li a limitation when there is an overpayment found. Um, DRS can only bill the member for three years of the overpayments from the date the error was discovered. Um, the rest of the overpayment, um, as well as lost investment earnings, like I spoke about before, are subsidized by the plan. So the employer is not charged, it just gets subsidized by the whole plan. So normally I wouldn't have um, data uh, this early in the process, uh, but DRS was able to provide me um, some information. Uh, so this was, I asked them for the last five years of recalcs that resulted in a change in a member's benefit. And so you can see there was uh, just under 3,500 recalcs during the last five years. Um, I did ask them, you know, just why so many recalcs? And so a big reason for that is that People want their first pension check immediately. They don't want to go a month without uh, without income. And so when DRS processes that first pension check, um, typically they're doing it based off, uh, so your FAS would be your final 60 months, and they typically only have the 59 months, your final 59 months, and so they're doing an estimate of what that last month is going to be. But that data doesn't come in till later, till after you've retired. And so that's why often there is a very slight change. Um, as you can see, most are in the zero to 1% change in benefit um, because of that additional data that comes in. And then it's further complicated with most firefighters and police officers. Um, their pay is a lot more complicated than uh, kind of your typical PERS employee. Um, and overtime in particular uh, will, will uh, often roll in a month late. And so that causes these changes. And I do want to say that it, I, it looks like the data may not be accurate as far as the uh, amount of the, the term overpayments. Um, so DRS is looking into that. They weren't able to give me an answer before I spoke today, but it looks like that might have been flipped and that's actually was mostly, uh, it was the 3,300 of them were underpayments, not overpayments, but they're still uh, looking to verify that. But the rest of the data is correct as far as the number that resulted in a benefit change and then the percentage of that change. Um, and then to give you an idea of just kind of the scope of how large those are, there were seven that had a monthly benefit difference of more than $1,000. Um, but you can see a, a much larger number had a difference of less than $100. Yeah. Thanks, Jacob. Um, so most of these recalcs then are usually done within the first month, or is that not accurate. How, how I'm going to look back at, at for a nod from no. Okay. Yeah. So, because yeah. you're saying like that 59th month, waiting for the 60th month, when does that recalc occur? So, is it outside of that window? You know, that I think there's a pretty quick window there to make a decision, right? Yes. As well, for the survivor option, right? Yes. Um, yeah. Uh, pr pretty immediate. Um, it's 90 days. Right. So I, you know, I didn't ask for that data. So I know I provided that a few years yeah. ago, but I, at the top of my head, I can't remember uh, kind of. Yeah, yeah, average. I know they try to prioritize them, the ones that they are confident are going to be larger. They have a process of identifying those, processing those first, and then getting to the smaller ones later. And typically, again, it changes over time depending on workloads, but usually that um, they try to keep all the recalcs within six months is the kind of the, the guideline. Yeah. Okay. So 
So then there's the repayment options. When a member does have an overpayment, what are their options for paying that back? They can do a lump sum payment, uh, 90 days to pay back the full amount. Uh, an installment plan is another option. Um, typically that's uh, over 36 months to, to make installment payments. And then uh, I think the most common option is the actuarial reduction option where their pension is actuarially reduced by an amount equal to the overpayment. And they have 90 days to make a choice and then it defaults to the actuarial reduction. And then another uh, part of this process that can occur is a DRS director has the authority to waive overpayments. Um, I have some data there of how often that occurs. The years that aren't listed, it's because there were no approvals. And I did get updated data that there were no approvals um, in 2022. Um, so uh, the law requires that there be manifest manifest injustice has to have occurred for uh, the director to waive the overpayment. Uh, that hasn't been defined by DRS. There is a general legal definition, which I have there. And then I did look at other agencies um, and a couple of them, uh, mostly DSHS, um, had the most uh, kind of detailed definition of manifest injustice. And I think that's in part just because they, being so much larger, and the ALJ um, positions that work at DSHS having to make these decisions uh, sets the guidelines for them. Um, but DRS has not um, had that in rule ever. Um, and then some of those years you see the numbers pop up. You got the 12, the 15, 11. And that's, uh, I believe all three of those were due to there was a, um, an error made by DRS that impacted um, I think they were all actually left to uh, disability retirees where there were um, in all of those examples where there was an air made that affected multiple people. DRS waived, the, waived those overpayments in those examples. And that's why the numbers are higher those years. So next steps for the board uh, options are you may make a motion to receive a comprehensive report or take no action today. If there's any questions, we'd be happy to Try answering them. Any questions for Jacob? Seeing none. Is there a question there? No. Nope. No questions. All right. What's the pleasure of the group? Make a motion to move forward with uh, step number one to uh, receive a comprehensive report. Okay. Is there a second? Sure, I'll second. Thank you. Motion has been made and seconded to adopt uh, number one, which is the board may make a motion to receive a comprehensive report. Discussion on the motion. Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion is adopted. Thank you. Number is number one. All right, Jacob, still in the hot seat. Item number four, which is a lump sum special death benefit. It's initial report. By way of quick background, this was um, uh, a fairly new issue. It was brought to the attention of the board here within the last couple of months by Roy, who's in the audience today and did a little bit of been doing some research with DRS on uh, getting some more information about this issue and when and how often it occurs and why. And so with that, um, I'll turn it over to Jacob. But again, this is a, a newer one for you guys. It's not one we've talked about any interim before this one. Hey, once again, for the record, Jacob White, staff to the board. Uh, I do just want to say I was getting information updates on this issue from DRS yesterday, so um, I'll provide that. Um, but just to, so that you're aware, it's uh, this issue is very active right now. So, what is the or first issue? Sorry. 
Um, so uh, the issue in front of you is that left plan two beneficiaries have been denied a one-time special death benefit uh, because they have missed LNI's deadline for application. So uh, what is the special death benefit? It's a one-time lump sum benefit paid to uh, beneficiaries. It actually, all the plans and systems have it, but for uh, uh, left two, it's a, a larger amount, which I'll get into the legislative history on, on a later slide. Um, uh, but they receive it if the member is found to have died as a result of a workplace injury or occupational disease. Uh, LNI determines um, the beneficiary's eligibility for the benefit, but the benefit itself is paid out of the pension plan. Um, uh, beneficiaries have been denied because they missed LNI's application deadline. Um, and it, this benefit's been in place, as you see, next slide actually has this, but it has been in place since 96, uh, but it's just been in the last year that there's been multiple cases of members being denied, or at least multiple cases have been brought to our attention. Um, in 2006, the board endorsed legislation that expanded the benefit to include deaths from occupational disease or infection um, before it had to be only from workplace injuries. Um, and then in 2010, the board uh, endorsed legislation that increased the minimum benefit and added a COLA. So what was the intent of the statute to apply LNI deadlines to a pension benefit? Um, that, that's unclear going back and looking at the legislative record uh, going back to 96. I have the language there in front of you um, as far as it, it it's very short, it just reads, the determination of eligibility for the benefit shall be made consistent with, and it cites L&I statute. Um, this is different than other pension benefits. Pension benefits typically do not have deadlines. Uh, you are paid what you have earned. Um, and like I said on a previous slide, this benefit is paid out of the pension fund, not out of, uh, not from L&I. Um, and then uh, speaking with some people involved more with L&I, um, it sounds like the statute of limitations for LNI benefits are typically there in part because of it becomes more and more difficult to prove whether an injury was caused um, in the workplace or not the further away you get from that injury. But that's a policy reason for having those deadlines. So current status, here's where there are updates. So uh, DRS and LNI have been working on reviewing these after they were brought to their attention. Um, and um, I can get into some of the specifics. I don't have all of the specifics. I can provide those at a later presentation, but just based off the conversations I had yesterday, um, there are three cases where uh, members have missed the deadline and uh, updates on at least two of those uh, are just a little bit of background on those two. So for one of them, it took uh, LNI more than a, so you have a one year deadline. It took LNI more than one year to make the determination uh, that it was a duty related death. And then once they made that determination, they said you didn't apply in the year, so you missed the deadline, um, even though they took a year to find out that it was a duty related death. And so, like I said, I haven't had a chance to review these records. This is just um, what I've been told the scenarios are here. Um, and uh, the other one, LNI denied that it was a duty-related death. And then uh, that person sued, went up to, through the courts. The courts found that it was a duty-related death. And LNI turned around and said, okay, but you missed the one-year window to apply for the special death benefit. So they denied them that benefit. On both of those examples, uh, DRS has been working with LNI on those, and LNI um, appears to be willing to um, reconsider those, and they're currently in the process of doing that. Um, yeah, so I, do, I was hoping to have an answer for you that they've approved them and we're good to go, but uh, um, no answer on that uh, today. Um, yeah, and I guess there, there was also concern from LNI about anything that would 
um, they, were, they were willing to look at those two because of the extenuating circumstances. And I believe they're willing to look at the third one too. I just apologize, I don't have the facts uh, down on that one. Um, but they were willing to look at all three of them because of extenuating circumstances of those situations like I described for the two. They weren't just simply someone missed a deadline. Um, it was much more complex than that. Um, so they're yeah showing a willing, willingness to to take another look at those, and it um, appears that they may end up approving them. Jacob, if, if this is a like clear duty related death, how does L and I reach out, or how does the process generally work? And so, is there you know m multiple opportunities for families to find out? Or how, you know, can you kind of describe that, or do you know? Yeah, so my understanding is there's not really a process to reach out to people. It's up to people to be aware of it. And so um, there is a form that DRS provides to people that uh, for duty injury, and it, it mentions this benefit on it, but it doesn't have that there's a deadline. It's something that our ombuds office mentions to people when they call with questions. But I don't think it's something that DRS or the left two board is really, you know, like there hadn't been an example of someone missing this deadline for years. And so I, I think that, you know, moving forward, there's going to be a lot more communication on that. But as far as like L and I having a process, it, to my understanding, there is no process. It's up to the member to know that this benefit's out there and exists. Yeah, the, the third case is kind of a better example of that. The other two, I mean, they were fighting over whether it was duty related or not. In the other case, um, when the member died, they had children, young children, no other spouse. So the grandparents were looking after the orphans and were trying to figure out what, if any, benefits they might be entitled to. And by the time they even learned of the existence of this benefit and the possibility that it might have applied to their kid who was a duty-related death and to the grandkids, they had missed the deadline. But there was no outreach to either the minor children or their guardians or anything like that in that situation. Yeah, it seems weird that it's their member's responsibility to know, but the member is dead, right? So how how do you <laughs> pass that along to those relatives that may not even be aware? Yeah, and there's no requirement for notification because that was my first question when the issue was brought is there has to be some, is there some duty to notify people of this and, and there is not? Is there as we move forward, is there a way that we can make a proposal or a suggestion on how this can be modified so we can do that? I mean, I think when people end up in a situation, you know, where it's a family trying to review things, I mean, if you had a piece of paper or some sort of document that, you know, kind of a checklist or whatever, I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, it just seems like it's crazy. Like, like Steve's saying, is that the person who might know is not here. Um, yeah. So. I I mean, I think that would be an option, a policy option moving forward would be to, you know, look at either do we need to change the law would be an option for the board as as well as um, improving our communications, working with DRS to, to uh, uh, you know, improve communication and notification of these benefits and make it very clear there is a deadline. Right. Right. Obviously, I'd, I always prefer that we don't have to pass any laws to change these things. So is there more kind of back channeling you can do to find out what's going to happen with these three cases, maybe what's going forward, if there's different policy um, decisions that might be made without a change in law, or how, how are we, uh, what, what kind of steps do we see by maybe ne by September? Do we see some possible changes? Well, as Jacob mentioned, both agencies, it's kind of new and there's a lot going on. So both in terms of reviewing the existing cases, reviewing WACs, reviewing communication policies, all of that is ongoing, but we don't know what the results are going to be or the timeline of that is going to be. As soon as we know, you'll know, but as far as like changing any notification policies by September, I would doubt that it would happen that quickly. Um, by September, I think we should be able to tell you whether or not they're going to move forward on those three cases and potentially whether they've decided to adopt a new WAC or not. But it, the new WAC would still be a year from, you know, being implemented. 
Yeah, and it's my understanding that at least right now there isn't an interest by L and I to change that they make the determination and their deadlines apply. Um, that they're just willing to look at cases with these extenuating circumstances and and consider those uh, kind of one-off cases. Let me let me real quick. I'm gonna get okay. Wolf real quick. Go ahead, Wolf. Yeah, I, I would just say that uh, your local government employers are often uh, the modulator in this. Uh, when the duty related death occurs, for example, in Pierce County, where we have a self-insured uh, workers' comp program that operates under LNI rules, uh, we conduct ourselves in a way that informs the family and all uh, the, the manager of the estate, if necessary, however that's going to be done, uh, should there be a duty related death. And we, in fact, do have a checklist and our HR people and our risk managers are uh, both directly involved in making sure that we deliver as much information as possible. So it does not, in our case, count on the uh, individual who passed away to have known what the rules were. It, it is something we take upon ourselves. And I think that may explain why in the many cases and for the longest period of time, there haven't been many instances of this, which people have not been aware, not been able to file. And I think extenuating circumstances notwithstanding in these cases, uh, might, might well have been uh, not knowing who to talk to or how to get that information to them. Uh, but certainly on the instances I can recall of uh, several duty related deaths uh, since I've been with Pierce County, uh, we've had a fairly organized and direct outreach with such a checklist. So there are models out there. And I think that I uh, agree with the previous speaker that I'm not sure it has to be in rule or law. And I'm not sure that DRS or L and I are the best emanators of that information uh, directly, uh, because they're not necessarily as closely correlated with the employer itself. Thank you, Wolf. Any questions or comments? All right, Tarina, go ahead. Yes, um, I just want to mentioned um, adding to Wolf's comments. Are these smaller agencies that maybe do not have the larger departments, HRs to to know to handle these types of things? Do we even know if it's a larger agency, smaller agencies, maybe there's a gap because of smaller groups? That's a good question. I, I don't know the employers off the top of my head, but I will look into that because, um, yeah, that's a good point. Thanks, Tarina. Go ahead. It, it definitely feels to me like if there's a question about whether it's duty related or not, and that determination isn't made until a year later, that the clock wouldn't start until that determination is made. Is there any potential, you know, is that basically what LNI is looking at? I, I'm, I'm trying to understand how LNI could say, well, it's been over a year, um, but we didn't determine it was duty related until after a year, so there's no opportunity. It's that that's where it just doesn't make any sense. I'm trying to figure what, what is Illinois' response to that? Um, well, yeah. I, we'll see that there's a little bit of overlap on the next issue as well. Under the Administrative Procedures Act, tolling is not something that's automatic. So if something is in process, yeah, you've reached this kind of from a logical standpoint, this unusual conclusion where we haven't even made a decision that you can appeal until it's after the deadline for you to appeal it, you would think there would be a, a tolling thing there that your one year deadline wouldn't start until we made the final decision, which would also be consistent with the Administrative Procedures Act, but agencies have flexibility in there. Um, and that's probably why LNI is um, willing to, they see that as a, a kind of unfair, if you will, and um, are willing to, to look at uh, uh, making exceptions. And I believe there's, at least on one of these, if not all three, that there's active litigation still going on. Um, so they're not, yeah, courts have not decided. Mr. Chair, go ahead. <clears throat> Thank you, Jacob. So in, in our discussions, we've heard from many people today, I mean, it seems that there's obvious that there's many different paths.
paths where this can go awry, whether it's, as Wolf mentioned, you could have an employer who's very on top of it, has an HR staff that takes that under their own umbrella, and then you may have small agencies that don't have that at all. And then we're dealing with two other entities where one has a manifest injustice clause and one does not, but we also have the overarching law that Steve just mentioned as far as you know administrative injustice. So there's all these different islands um, and there's it's kind of fraught with opportunities for miscommunication. Uh, and granted, you know, we're talking about a very small number of, of these incidents, um, but clearly it's on our table this morning, so it's something that we're trying to, adjust, to address. Um, and I think that kind of leads us to that next step is, well, what do we do? How do we do this? Um, the manifest injustice clause that DRS has, um, with the understanding, you may not know this, I don't want to put you on the spot, but does L and I have something like that? Or Steve, do they just rely on you know, the injustice whack? No, they're, they're following their whack and their statute. So in their mind, it's not a manifest injustice. However, they are willing to see these are unusual circumstances and they might have some flexibility in that so to where they can um, treat these as one-offs, for lack of a better word, rather than mm -hmm. requiring a statutory or WAC change to their process. But we, we won't know the final answer on that until maybe September. Could it be that late, Jacob, or is I, that I, even I think there's a chance. I think there's a chance we hear by then. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, and I think from we're hearing all this secondhand, so that's kind of one of the problems with talking about it. But it, it is my understanding that there was just concern about opening up to liability going back to who knows how far. Right. And so being able to identify that there are these situations or at least one off situations and there's a way to settle them without opening you know, the agency up to additional litigation on old cases was a concern. That Jacob, uh, I, what I hear is that DRS will pay the benefit uh, if LNI says so, and then LNI takes their time to decide, and if they don't get in that window, is the director of DRS and the director of LNI talking to figure out how to fix this and maybe do it without having to do legislation? So as we move forward, and is there anybody that we have in the room that's helping them with language if that's the way they decide to go? So yes, it's my understanding they have spoken to each other, uh, the directors, and then um, yeah, have their staff working on, on resolving at least these three issues and then yeah, looking at the whole, um, the whole issue of, of the, having the deadline. Um, like I said, I don't, it doesn't sound like they're going to move forward on not having a deadline, but they are working together to resolve the cases we've brought to their attention. Okay, I understand the, the length yeah. of time it takes. They, they, they have the length of time because five years down the road, somebody says it was a duty death and I need to get my benefit and all the records are either gone or nobody has anything in there. So, you, so that makes it more difficult to make that decision. But if you have an obvious one that is lost in you know, just lost in what uh, Wolf was talking about in Summit or Trina was talking about in smaller counties and stuff like that, that the not, the member's gone, the beneficiary has no idea what they're entitled to, and they finally figure out that somebody finally comes to them and says, you know, in this county, line of duty, you would have received this. And I think that's what we're looking at now is that there are obvious cases out there. Uh, that I hope L and I, and I, you know, it's really not, you know, it's that old, you know, it's, it's a lot easier to deny than to accept what needs to happen. So if the two directors decide to move forward, the language they get, it would make sense that at least our director here would have, and his staff would have a chance to look at the language to clean it up once instead of having to patchwork it down the road. Yeah, so, so it's my understanding they're not looking at language, so they're not looking at proposing a change in the law yeah. um, or anything like that, but looking at, yeah, resolving the three cases. Um, but once they resolve the three, there might be more. And I, yeah. we don't want to keep on coming back 
and patch it. You know, it's it's the old hole in the inner tube. How many times are you going to patch the inner tube? If you if you actually fix the inner tube right the first time, then you don't have to worry about it from that point on. So uh, I'm not sure how we get that discussion going, but the crux of this is police and fire because of the you know the the way our contracts are scheduled and the, and, the, and the amount of money for a duty uh, line of duty death there is you know it'd be nice that we had clear concise language on how it protects uh, beneficiaries or, or survivors uh, to police and fire and and I'm not disparaging anybody else but as an, as one of the employer reps it'd make it a lot easier on me if I had clear and concise language when somebody when one of my employees passes that I can point to this and say, this is what you're going to get, this is how it's going to go down, and move forward. So I hope that's where we're headed. I think that would be really good because talking about the, the member that passes away is also incumbent on the employer to do the right thing. And if they don't know what the right thing is until it's too late, then they have a, uh, one of their employees that they valued is not getting the respect they should get. So. Just that's my commentary, and hopefully it, it goes someplace, and we can get the two sides to get together, and then work work with our director to come up with some. Even though you say it's only three cases, they're trying to limit themselves on liability. I understand that, yeah. but on the other hand, they they need to do the right thing for people that may need to be considered also. Steve, did you have something else? Just making sure. Yeah, I just, you know, the, when you said they're afraid of the liability, we're, we're talking about members that have passed away in the line of duty or deep line of duty related, right? So these are people that are rightly, uh, these families probably deserve those those dollars. So I'm trying to figure out what liability they're really hiding from, if that's money that probably should have gone out to those families, yeah. you know, every family that, that has uh, that situation. And, and I might have, I think I misused the word liability. I think resources was the term used for me, the amount of resources it would take to um, go back and look into those cases and process, yeah. yeah. All right, pleasure of the group. So, uh, yeah, next steps. Uh, options are uh, motion for staff to provide a comprehensive report or take no action today. Um, yeah, and I don't know, Steve, as far as like an, uh, I guess more detail could be provided in a comprehensive report about the specifics, but as far as I don't know if there's a third option for kind of just an update on what's happened with the discussions. Well, yes. So given the fact that this is kind of an, as Jacob mentioned, it's a very active topic and both L&I and DRS are working on it. If you made a motion, for instance, for a comprehensive report, that could be part of that report could be that these three cases have been resolved, but there's been no agreement on a change in process. And so you might still move forward with the idea of changing the process. But it probably uh, wouldn't take place until November. Um, if, if we knew, had some solid info for you by September, we could possibly do it then, but uh, based on kind of where things are at, my guess is it won't be until November before we can give you any solid info about what L&I and DRS are or are not willing to do on this. Okay. All right, two options in front of us, number one or number two. I'd like to make a motion. So um, on my presentation, I'd like to make a motion. I'll read it because it's, it's not on that screen, but uh, motion for a comprehensive report contingent on DRS and LNI discussions not resolving the issue. Yeah, I should have added that too. I apologize. I, there was the, what was distributed to you was a prior draft that had more detailed options. So um, just a warning that that's what, what you're seeing there. Gotcha. Okay. Second. I'll second that. All right, motion's been made and seconded to Oh Lord, go ahead and read it for me, buddy. <laughs> I know it's a it's contingent on L and I and and DRS. Yeah, well, as we just got for for discussion purposes, um, you know, if if we can fix it, you know, without having to right. change the law or whack, that would obviously be the preference. But all right, I got it here now. Motion for a comprehensive report contingent on DRS and L and I discussions on resolving the issues. So that's the motion. Discussion on the motion, and it's been seconded as well. Discussion. 
Wolf, go ahead. I see your hand popped up. Yeah, thank you. I, I, I would just urge uh, a bit of caution uh, that we get more information. I support the motion uh, to obtain more information uh, about exactly what's going on here in particular as it pertains to a, a choice, really. Are these cases really singularities uh, from which we would not want to overgeneralize and propose larger scale solutions, or are they uh, tip of iceberg suggestive of other similar cases? Uh, I think we need to know a little more about how those work in relation to current law and current practice and, and, and the WACs uh, as they stand and uh, see where that goes. Uh, I think there's some danger in over speculating at this point and more information would be helpful. Thank you, Wolf. Agree. Other comments? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Jacob, still in the hot seat. Looks like item number five, which is the DRS appeal deadline since the initial uh, presentation. By way of by way of brief background, this is also a, um, a newer issue. It was not discussed during the last interim. This was an issue that um, board staff was working with on DRS last year, kind of behind the scenes to see if it could be uh, resolved administratively, and then um, wasn't. Um, and then so it was uh, on your potential list for interim action uh, that you adopted uh, earlier this interim. And with that, I'll turn it over to Jacob. Okay, for the last time today, for the record, Jacob White, staff to the board. Uh, issue here is that some left two members have missed their deadline to file an administrative appeal with DRS and then express concerns regarding a lack of clarity um, on the deadline. So the APA, the Administrative Procedures Act, uh, Steve talked a bit about in the well, during the last presentation, um, it sets minimum agency standards for adjudicative proceedings. And one of those minimum standards is uh, a, at least 20 days to file an appeal. Although agencies, it's a minimum standard, agencies can set that higher if they would like. Um, so what is the appeal process at DRS? So uh, it starts off with a DRS uh, on the member side. So for member decisions, it starts off uh, with a DRS plan administrator decision. So a member can make that request. They get denied a benefit or any anything they believe they were entitled to that they did not receive from DRS. They can ask for a DRS plan administrator decision. And so that's kind of a, a management level um, at DRS. And they... Um, uh, do a, writ a more detailed written decision. So you're just getting, it provides an opportunity for the member to get more information about why they're being denied. Typically that might cite some, you know, point to some law, some rule of, of explaining that denial. Um, there's no deadline for a member to make that request. And then the member can do what's called the, a petition. And so they have 120 days to file a petition. Um, that's not a required step under the APA. It's a step that uh, DRS has set up to help, um, it, it helps on a few levels. Um, it helps, uh, gives DRS an opportunity to take a, a more detailed look at, at a case and um, be more certain about their decision before it goes to the appeal level. And then it also provides uh, an opportunity to explain in greater detail to the member why they're being denied. And also, it's it's almost like a um, alternative dispute resolution step where it's less it's designed to be less difficult for for a member, um, less intimidating. Uh, once you get to the appeal level, you're talking about it's you might not be in like court court, but it's a more court like proceeding where the petition level is much more informal. There can be easy communication with the petition officer, um, opportunity to discuss, provide more information, that type of thing. Um, and then you get a, uh, a more detailed legal uh, looking decision with um, kind of a, uh, the citations to laws, sometimes case law, a, now, a more thorough analysis uh, explaining the agency, agency's conclusion. 
And then um, and sometimes DRS does overturn their decisions uh, at that level. It, it does occur. Um, and then after that uh, petition decision, it can go to appeal and there's 60 days to file that appeal. And then after that decision that's made by a uh, ALJ that is um, in-house with DRS, most, uh, not about most, but a lot of agencies have kind of in-house ALJs and then some agencies contract that out, um, but DRS has it uh, internally. Um, and then from there, it can go to superior court. Um, there's a slightly different process for employers because that's handled not by the member side of DRS, it's by the employer side of DRS, but the deadlines end up being the same as far as a petition appeal. It's the plan administrator step is different. So how does DRS communicate those deadlines to members? Um, the petition and appeal decisions um, and, and the plan administrator decision um, all have a kind of boilerplate language uh, that goes on to that decision explaining what the next step in the process is and the time frame you have to do it. Um, also, the petition and appeal deadlines are in rule. So uh, what specific concerns have left two members brought to our attention? So the one of those is that the deadline to file an appeal and the deadline to file a petition are different. And um, at least one member uh, cited that as causing uh, confusion uh, for missing the appeal deadline. And then um, the other uh, example uh, case, case is that the deadline to file an appeal does not include tolling, which Steve referenced in the previous presentation but it did, did not include tolling to gather and provide additional records. And on that specific case, it was further complicated by um, at the administrative decision level, getting a deadline, the member got a deadline, and then they got a petition decision and that had a different deadline. And so there was confusion about these different deadlines being provided and when the appeal window actually was. So the member continued to gather records in relation to that first deadline they were given um, and then uh, missed their appeal deadline because the appeal deadline came up before that initial deadline they were given. That was, um, which is, I almost need like to draw out a map of this for you, but yeah. So there was, pretty much there was confusion. So there was different dates given and the confusion by the member about which date applied to them. Um, And I, I should add, just like the, not similar to the last uh, issue, um, these these have been active cases. Um, actually, you know, I'll get into that uh, future slide. I've got a slide coming up. I'll get touch base on that. Um, so the just some legislative history. So this uh, issue did come out of a bill. Uh, there was a bill last ses session that. Um, the DRS Ombuds Bill is what we were referring to it as, that there were multiple uh, other issues in addition to creating an Ombuds position at DRS. Uh, that bill did not pass, uh, but here's just a little detail about what that bill would have done in relation to this issue. It would have increased the deadline to file an appeal to 90 days. It would have allowed for uh, tolling no less than 90 additional days when DRS requests additional records from a member and it uh, would have allowed retirees that previously filed a claim that was dismissed for failing to file a timely notice um, have additional time to, to refile that claim. Um, and that bill did, did not pass last session. Um, so I was able to get some data from DRS uh, last five years. Um, just to give you an idea of just kind of the workload of petitions and appeals and how many have been denied for this. So there were 75 petitions over the last five years, 25 of those were left to. Um, zero of those were denied for being timely. Um, and that's with that longer uh, time frame to file. And then in the last five years, uh, appeals, uh, there were 37 appeals and 14 of those were from left two members. And um, officially at this, at this point, there's only one that's been denied the other case I referenced is in the appeal process right now. Um, I was hoping to have a decision before I present it today, but it looks like that decision is probably another month or so away. Um, uh, but so there may end up being two, the two appeals that have been denied. 
So, Jacob, the one that's in process, that was the one where the member was asked to provide additional information, and then they did within that deadline, but then they were told, you missed your appeal deadline, and their case was dismissed, but it's being, they're appealing that dismissal, and the appeal is not final. Is that Yes, right. that's in front of the ALJ at DRS. And the other one has been completely dismissed and they're at Superior Court. So they were, yeah, they were actually, so there was a Court of Appeals decision last week um, that denied their claim. So they, they had, uh, yeah, they'd gone through the DRS appeals process and then skipped Superior Court that was moved up to the Court of Appeals. And the Court of Appeals just issued a decision last week denying their um, their claim. So, um yeah, and then I no word on whether they're going to uh, petition that to the Supreme Court or not. Okay, so next steps would be to motion for a comprehensive report or take uh, no action. All right, thank you, Jacob. I do have one question for you regarding the timelines. Is there a time frame in which somebody would have to petition to go to court after the Benini? You know, not that I'm aware of. I, do you know, Steve? I, I don't know. I Just the way I read it, it looked like the flow would be uh, yeah, go to your DRS plan. Some of the time, days. There, there is a statute of limitations. Yeah. That's for it. it um, I was going to say, yes, there is, but I don't know exactly what it is. This is Tor. So we can look into that and get back to you. So. Just curious. All right. Thanks, Tor. Yeah. yeah. Good to see you. <laughs> Please, Steve, do you have anything else? No, to Tor's right. The, there's a statute of limitations for contracts um, once kind of the injury becomes final, and there's a statute of limitations for, I can't remember now, something else. One's three years, one's four years, and at different times, both of those statutes of limitations have been applied to pension benefits. Okay. Tarina, go ahead, please. Sorry. Uh, yes, I'd like to make the motion, um, if this is the time for it, to have a comprehensive report. It is the time. The motion is in order. Is there a second? Second. Motion has been made and seconded to adopt um, number one, which is the motion for the comprehensive report. Discussion or questions on the motion? Yeah. Mr. Chair. Go ahead, sir. Just for the purpose of discussion, I think that um, any time I, I uh, chuckled inside when we got to a point, I think at any point where we actually need to do a flow chart on something that really should be a simpler process, um, I think that's something that we should look at and simplify that process so we're not at flow chart level. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Can we use colors? Okay. Yeah. All right. So we have a motion before us. Any other discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion is adopted. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Jacob. Thank you. Thank you, Jacob. Thanks. All right. Number six on our agenda is the video premiere all right we're we're trying something um new today as you're aware the board over the years has produced uh, videos which we put online for frequently asked questions or um complicated topics where we get a lot of member requests for additional additional information and those videos are short informative and they've been very well received uh, last year, the board instructed the, us to produce more of those videos. This year, um, the first one that we identified has to do with the ombudsman program. What are they there for? What do they do and what do they not do? That video has just recently been completed and so we're going to show you that video, but at the same time, we do, it'll, it'll be a, a brief moment to take a break um, if you'd like. And there are, um, there's, uh, we're doing it like a movie. So I'm not sure who, there. there's popcorn in the break room. 
everybody, including guests, so I'm looking at the audience here, is welcome to refreshments. We've got plenty there. So if you want to quick grab a bag while we're setting up the uh, screen to run this, it'll just be a minute. One bag, Sean. <laughs> Yeah, we, we don't have any previews of, of coming attractions. All right. Well, I think, yeah, if it's more comfortable, it should be on that screen there, Dennis. No, I'd rather It's like front seat. Okay. Okay. All right. Let's, let's roll. All right. Here we go. Here we go. All right, thank you. Very good. And Tor, how excited are you right now? I am so excited. <laughs> that was epic. I appreciate the well. You've got to thank the Swedes. So yeah, you yeah. It, you pronounce it almost the same. Ombuds mom. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was watching your face, and you. I was watching your eyes follow the little boat go up and down and around the island. I was watching you. So. Nice. I think these videos are, are very helpful. They're, they're short. And they break it down, what we're trying to get across the messaging, and I think our members appreciate this kind of stuff. So thank you very much. Uh, and we do occasionally. We have confusion over what Tammy can and cannot yeah. do, so getting it out there in the video helps with that. Hopefully avoid misunderstandings about, the, the, you know, about what the ombudsman can and can't do. Um, they have helped the, the this office has helped so the ombudsman office i'm talking about has helped so many people over the years um uh, representative burquist you special kudos to you because you took the you got it created um and um that but with that um one piece, kind of a segue into the administrative update, which is next on the agenda. You'll notice for the Ombudsman office, when we were putting the pictures up there for staff, um, it was only Tammy. So that that was a, uh, here recently, Sarah White, who was also an Ombudsman, accepted a new position with the Department of Retirement Systems. And so we'll be filling the, another ombudsman position here in the uh, near future. But um, but for now, Tammy is the sole person. Again, she managed the she managed that agency that unit for herself for years. The volume, as you heard, has gone up to the point where she can't be expected to handle a year's worth of cases at the point where they're at now we've got we got some time um, but I'll have somebody I'll get I'll keep you updated as far as um, hiring a replacement for Sarah she was fantastic I've said all along I would rather have somebody excellent for a short period of time than somebody mediocre forever and Sarah is an example of having somebody excellent for a short period of time um, and even though she's at DRS, she's going to be doing appeals and stuff, which, as you can tell, yeah. if, if um, <laughs> how those decisions go over there can affect the workload here as well. So I'm um, excited for her and we'll be we'll be able to continue uh, kind of working with her in her role at DRS, if you will. Um, but. That is the, the first thing on the admin update. We don't have any, any um, outreach activities scheduled for the next month. Um, you'll recall the August meeting of the left two board was canceled. So the next meeting of the board is actually, what is it, September 27th. Um, the 
the, um, for the last item on the agenda for public comment, to my knowledge, at the start of the meeting, we had not received any requests for public comment, either in writing or anything. Did anything come up during the meeting? No. So there, there is no uh, public comment to share with the board. And that concludes my administrative update, Mr. Chair. All right. And since we don't have or have not received any public comment, there are no other items on our agenda. Would entertain a motion to adjourn. Second. Motion's been made and seconded to adjourn. Not seeing any discussion. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? All right. We are adjourned and we will be back on September 27th at 930. So thank you, everybody, for joining us on a nice day. Thank you. Be safe in your travels.